All of these people have one thing in common. They're all at risk for CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a brain disease caused by repetitive hits to the head. It can be deadly, and it's much more common than you think. Here are the facts. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a progressive neurodegenerative brain disease. That means symptoms don't begin until years after the injuries and can often get worse over time, causing dementia. And here's the kicker. You can only find out if you had it if you are dead. When your head gets hit, nerve cells are damaged and a protein called tau gets released. Repeated hits to the head lead to more tau. When nerve cells are damaged, tau comes off and starts clumping up, becoming tangled. Tau can kill brain cells if enough builds up over time. High levels of tau in brain fluid are linked to poor recovery and neurodegeneration after head trauma. The origins of the disease trace back nearly a century ago when it was labeled pugilistic dementia, a syndrome that was originally studied in boxers. Forensic pathologist Dr. Harrison Stanford Martland described the disease in 1928 through his study, a journal of the American Medical Association. He noted tremors, slowed movement, confusion, and speech problems being typical of the condition. The disease was brought up again in 1949 by a British neurologist who published a study in a paper titled Punch Drunk Syndrome, Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy of Boxers. But it later became clear that the disease was appearing in athletes who never donned a pair of boxing gloves. CTE appeared in the limelight in the early 2000s when Nigerian neuropathologist Bennett Amalu worked on a case with former Hall of Fame NFL player Mike Webster, who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. After retirement, Webster began to show signs of depression, extreme mood swings, and eventually dementia. Footage from the documentary League of Denial shows Webster being interviewed and stopping mid-sentence. The things we do to one another, okay, uh, hell, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just tired and confused right now. That's why I say it. I can't really, <laughs> I can't say it the way I want to say it. I could, I could say, I could answer this real easy at, at other times, but right now I'm just tired. Webster had CTE and was the first NFL player diagnosed with a degenerative brain disease. Amalu's discovery led researchers to study the potential link of brain trauma in football and CTE further. In 2017, neuropathologist Anne McKee released her own study in the Journal of American Medical Association. McKee and her researchers studied 111 former NFL players whose brains were donated for research and discovered that 110 of them had CTE. We're really starting to understand the earliest manifestations of this disease and of course our main objective, our overarching goal is to help the people that are living be able to diagnose this disease during life so we can bring some hope and optimism to these people. If we can diagnose it, we can also monitor it, and we can test different therapies to see if they're effective in treating the disease. In the early stages of CTE, researchers found the most common cause of death among those with mild levels of CTE was suicide. One of the highest profile examples was the case of Aaron Hernandez, a former New England Patriots star who was convicted of first degree murder in 2013. He murdered Odin Lloyd, a former friend who dated Hernandez's fiance's sister. Guilty of murder in the first degree. Madam floor person. You're committed to the MCI Cedar Junction for the term of your natural life without the possibility of parole. I knew he was going to have CTE because you just don't get that amount of damage without seeing the changes under the microscope. And while in prison, Hernandez committed suicide. For those in later stages, dementia and Parkinson's disease was the leading cause of death. And it's estimated that, you know, the average football player gets between hundreds to a thousand hits per season. If you play for 10 years, you, you can imagine that's 10,000 hits. That's what we're trying to get more awareness about. We need to limit the amount of contact in football and collision sports. Among 27 participants that were found to have mild CTE, 26 had behavioral or mood issues before their deaths. Of the 84 deceased players with more severe cases, 89% had behavioral or mood symptoms. We're over 500 brains. I think it's about 550 at this point. It may not be quite that many. And we're well over 360 with the diagnosis of CTE. It's not just professional athletes or military soldiers that are being affected. Younger athletes are at risk for long-term consequences for later in life. Scientists have found that on average, playing tackle football before the age of 12 would lead to cognitive issues 13.39 years earlier 
behavioral and mood problems would arise 13.28 years earlier for those who began to play at 12 or older. Not only are young individuals at the forefront of CTE research, animals prone to brain injuries are also being studied as well. Gregory Meyer, director of research in sports medicine at Cincinnati's Children's Hospital Medical Center, offered his take in this New York Times article. Bighorn sheep ram their heads into each other and woodpeckers slam their head against trees thousands of times a day. Meyer's research has suggested that both of these animals' brains are well protected against concussions due to a phenomenon called the bubble wrap effect. Their brains are naturally protected with mechanisms that slow the return of blood from the head to the body, increasing blood volume that fills their brain's vascular tree. Outside of football, other sports have introduced concussion protocols. They're designed to keep players who may have sustained a traumatic brain injury from returning to the game. NFL players no longer practice as much in pads during the week and during training camps. The NFL has changed rules in terms of where a player can be hit, whether you can use your head as a battering ram. You no longer can, but that used to be a staple of NFL defenses. While safety reforms have been made to player concussions, NFL officials and college football coaches have often been criticized for questioning the research between football and CTE. It's clear that there is a link, um, so why they're denying it, I don't know. But there will come a time, hopefully sooner rather than later, that we will have a living diagnosis. And at that point, leagues will no longer be able to say, oh, we're, you know, we still need more science. The science will be there. Legislators across the U.S. have offered bills that would ban tackle football before the age of 12, but they've seen little traction becoming law. And well, the push for legislation comes as youth tackle football has seen a decline in participation. Interesting enough, it's a decline that's been seen at a regional level. The fears about CTE and the fears about the long-term damage to a child's health is a concern for any parent. And we're seeing parents ask more questions. We're seeing parents raise more concern until we have something like a living diagnosis where then we'll be able to say, okay, this person is predisposed genetically or you know, we can monitor a teenager as they play. 